So today's webinar is, is titled Introduction to Topographic Point Clouds. This is our second webinar in the series. Uh, my name is Matthew Beckley. Um, I'm a data scientist at Open Topography, and I'll be talking about LIDAR primarily. And Ramon Arrowsmith, who is a co-PI on the Open Topography Project, is with Arizona State University, and he's going to talk about structure from motion. Oops. Uh, so just a reminder, this again, this is the second webinar in our series. We have got a, a bunch more coming up at the same time every week. Um, if you can't make the, one of these webinars, they are being recorded and they're posted at our Open Topography channel on YouTube. So you could always watch them at uh, your leisure. Uh, just a little bit of logistics. So um, this is a Zoom webinar. So only moderators and presenters can speak. If you have a question, please post it to the Q&A section of Zoom. We have some uh, people online who will be answering questions as um, they come in, but we will also sort of maybe reserve questions towards the end um, and then address them there if there's time. We do have a lot of content to get through those. Um, so here's just a rough agenda. We're gonna go through some basic LIDAR theory. We'll talk about data collection, then uh, pass it to Ramon, who's gonna talk about structure from motion and how to derive data products from structure from motion. We'll talk about um, data files, point cloud classification, some open source tools. And then at the end, I'll just do a little live demo of how to access LiDAR data through open topography. Um, so those of you who are not familiar, LiDAR stands for light detection and ranging. It operates on the same principles as um, radar. So basically what happens is a pulse of light is emitted from your instrument, it travels through space, hits a target, is returned, and then is detected by a sensor. Um, critical to this operation is very accurate clocks. So when that laser pulse is emitted, um, it is time tagged. And then when it is returned, it is time tagged. And so knowing that light travels at the speed of light, obviously, you multiply that by your time of flight, divide by two, and you get your distance. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say on that slide. Um, so here's a graph of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum showing the wavelengths and size of wavelengths. So on the left, you have very uh, large wavelengths like radio and microwave. Uh, all the way to on the right, you have very destructive uh, small wavelength gamma rays. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, Radar and LIDAR operate on the same principle. So radar stands for radar uh, radio detection and ranging because the early radars were based in radio waves. Um, some of the later, later radar altimeters that came out um, were based in microwaves. So they had a, a little bit of a smaller wavelength um, and they performed quite well. Um, one of the big benefits of having a larger wavelength is that it doesn't get attenuated by weather so uh, radar altimeters were able to penetrate clouds, fog, uh, rain, things like that. The downside of those altimeters was that it's a very long wavelength and so your footprint on the ground is quite large. And that would um, result in the fact that you couldn't really resolve really fine scale features. So if you wanted uh, finer resolution, you had to move to something like LIDAR. So I've marked LIDAR as um, where it is on the frequency spectrum here. And, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. Most of LIDARs are in the near infrared, but there are some in the visible spectrum. And so that smaller wavelength enables us to get finer resolution on the ground because the footprint on the ground that that beam intersects is much smaller. Um, one of the downsides is some of the LIDAR wavelengths can be attenuated by weather. So it won't be able to penetrate clouds or deep fog, um, but, users can always tweak which LiDAR wavelength they use. So for example, users who are studying bathymetry uh, can use 532 nanometer wavelength, which is a green in the green uh, visible spectrum. And with that wavelength, uh, you can penetrate into shallow seas, lakes, rivers, get bathymetry, water column. Um, you can also penetrate clouds. Um, so there's trade-offs. Um, and some people use LIDAR for atmospheric studies of measuring ozone concentrations, smog, uh, dust, other atmospheric constituents. 
for those types of scientific applications, you can tweak which wavelength you use to better get a return depending on what you are studying. Um, so LiDAR is pretty ubiquitous these days. You can find it on a variety of platforms, uh, everything from drones, cars, um, satellites, helicopters. Most of the data in uh, open topography is based on low to mid-altitude aircraft uh, collections, but we do have a fair amount uh, of terrestrial laser scanning. You'll often see that referred to as TLS. Uh, that's when a LiDAR system is placed on a tripod and, and scans the near surface. Um, but yeah, you're even starting to see LiDAR in tape measures and range finders or these two instruments you see here in the middle. So it's really become quite uh, ubiquitous in the field. So this slide uh, is going to talk about what a um, aircraft LiDAR collection would look like. And there's three main components to an aircraft LiDAR collection. Uh, you have the actual laser. Um, and its sensor, or it's often referred to as a detector. You have an IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit. It's often also referred to as an INS, inertial navigation system. And then you have the GPS, both on the plane and on the ground. And all three of these are critical to accurate collection. But with aircraft, the IMU is particularly critical because, as you can imagine, you have this aircraft that's bouncing around in space, it's moving up and down. Um, and in order to know how that laser is sort of accurately positioning in 3D space, um, the IMU takes care of that. Um, it has gyroscopes and it's able to accurately record in space where that laser is and where it's pointing. Um, and that's a critical component um, to these collections. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about how a laser pulse would interact with the ground, say, in a forest environment. Um, in an idealized scenario for an aircraft, uh, the aircraft would be flying over the trees. It would send a pulse down, hit the top of a tree, get a return. Um, in a more realistic scenario, uh, most LIDARs these days are not uh, sampling along the track. They're actually sweeping back and forth or they're conically sweeping. So you do get some nadir points, nadir meaning a pulse directly orthogonal to the plane. Um, but many of your LIDAR pulses are going to be at an angle intersecting many different things. It may intersect things in the atmosphere. Um, so in this case, the ladder pulse will go down. It'll intersect the top of the trees. There will be some branches in between. It may or may not hit the ground depending on the, the density of that vegetation. Um, so I like this figure in particular because it shows sort of this, these sort of shadows, um, which in this case, LIDAR might not make it to the ground, in which case you'd see no data in those locations, but depends on your LIDAR system, how dense the vegetation is. A general rule of thumb that I like, that I've heard that's interesting to me is that if you're on the forest floor standing and you look up and you can see sky, LIDAR will be able to hit that, the ground. So it's pretty amazing under what conditions you can get a ground return. Um, but if you're in a scenario where it's very dense tropical forest, um, overlapping and you can't see the sky, most LIDARs won't be able to penetrate that. Um, one other quick comment about water. Um, water can sometimes be troublesome depending on which system you're using. Uh, it can often act as a mirror or sometimes a black body. So if you're flying over very flat water and it's a nadir pulse, sometimes that, that pulse will just get absorbed and you won't get a return. If it's very flat and the pulse is coming at an angle, the pulse may just shoot off into space and won't return to the detector. Uh, we found that if there's a little bit of wave action from wind and there's some roughness to the water, you'll get some good returns from the surface of the water. But again, depending on what your study is, if you're really looking to study water and hydrology, you would use something like a 532 nanometer uh, laser, which can get a return from the surface and penetrate the water. Um, so here's just a cool figure. This is from Ian Madden at Dogami, which is Department of Geology and Mineral Industries at uh, Oregon. Um, this was a picture of a tree outside of his office, and then they had actually did a LIDAR scan. And so this picture on the left <clears throat> is showing sort of uh, a plot of that LIDAR colored by return number. Um, so all the points in red were the first returns that came back to the detector. Uh, yellow are the second returns, and then green is third, 
And the main thing to see here is that obviously there are less green returns and you can even see that sort of shattering effect um, that's in cases where LIDAR actually didn't reach the ground because there were too many returns from the tree. Um, so for this slide, I'm going to talk about sort of the evolution of these LIDAR detectors because they're critical to the operation and how users sort of see the data end product. Um, so early on, a very simple scenario was you'd have a single pulse out from your LIDAR laser and you get a single return. Um, and it was very simple, very easy, um, but limited. So that, that evolved very quickly into multiple return systems where you'd have a single pulse of light, but you might get multiple returns from that one single pulse. So you would get a return from the top of the canopy, maybe mid canopy and maybe ground. Um, and that evolved even further, mostly driven by sort of the forestry and um, uh, vegetation scientific community, because very often for them, just getting a return from the top of the canopy and the bottom was not sufficient to estimate biomass or fuel loads or carbon loading. Um, so they sort of pushed to have full waveform digita digitized LIDAR. And what that means is basically illustrated with this graph on the left. And so this graph is showing a red line plotting intensity versus time. And basically the entire energy profile is shown as a distribution or a waveform. And so here you can see there's a little peak in intensity um, when the laser pulse gets shot out, that pulse of light travels through the atmosphere. Hopefully it doesn't intersect a whole lot. And then it finally will intersect your target. In this case is a forest. And so you'll start to see um, energy increase as it hits the um, dense part of the canopy. And then it goes down and then maybe it hits the understory and there's another peak in the waveform. And then finally there'll be a peak uh, at the ground return. And so this whole distribution helps that forestry community sort of estimate biomass, which is a critical component of a lot of their research. Um, the downside of full waveform LIDAR is that for the end user, it's very difficult to use. Most people don't want to plot LIDAR, uh, plot waveforms and have to pick out where the elevation is. So a lot of modern uh, LIDARs are actually flying a waveform, but they provide the user with a multi-return type data product. So as part of their data processing, they will go in and pick out the top of the canopy, the understory and the ground and provide that to their users. Um, so two examples of full waveform data are JEDI and ISAT-1, uh, both NASA um, missions. Um, and then a newer one, which I won't talk that much about, is a photon counting system. Um, so ISAT, NASA's new mission, ISAT-2, is a photon counting system. Uh, photon counting <clears throat> is a very low power laser. It floods the surface with photons. But critical to the system is a very, very accurate detectors. And so those detectors can um, detect just a, a dozen or so photons coming back and determine the ground from that. Um, it's really um, advanced. It's really cool. Um, the downside of it is it's very algorithm um, heavy. So because those detectors are so sensitive, they get a lot of noise. They're sensitive to a lot of background solar radiation. So they have to have some pretty advanced algorithms to pick out the noise, pick out the signal from that noise. So as I mentioned in the previous couple slides, you know, data collection is very complicated. There's a lot going on. And as you can imagine, that goes into the data processing as well. So you have, as I mentioned, those three or four reference frames that you have to sort of work. You have the reference frame of the IMU, the laser ranging and angles. Uh, you have the two GPS systems that you have to coordinate, um, the aircraft trajectory. So all of this goes into the data processing to ultimately produce a point on the ground, X, Y, and Z. Um, the main purpose of this slide is to just to sort of warn users that not all LIDAR is created equal. Um, there are a lot of errors that go into this thing. Um, people, you can slap a LIDAR on a drone and fly it around, but it's not going to be maybe as good as uh, you know, a properly calibrated aircraft mission with a really high-end IMU and a lot of base stations on the ground. So users just need to be aware of the different errors. Um, GPS and IMUs can um, be a big source of errors, but there's other sources as well, such as weather, vegetation. Uh, the terrain itself can be a big issue, particularly slopes. And with radars, that was a huge problem because you had this 
big footprint. And then if it hit a large slope, that footprint is spread out and it's very difficult to get an accurate measurement in those scenarios. Uh, so warning to users, just always look at the metadata and survey reports and look at um, the quality of the data that you're using. Um, so at this point, I'm just gonna um, turn it over to Ramon, who's gonna yeah, talk thanks. about yeah. structure from motion. So another way you can get um, good information about the 3D characteristics of the ground surfaces from structure from motion, which is um, a method that uses the principles of photogrammetry and is more of a passive approach rather than active, meaning the laser being shot out and coming back. And there's a lot of content that we have on this topic as well as much of what we're talking about today uh, in our opentopography.org slash learn slash workshops because we've done several Structure for Motion workshops at recent Geological Society of America annual meetings. So the basic concept is shown on the right where you see that a 3D model might be the target, uh, you know, the ground surface, and that uh, those red dots might be features uh, of interest, some uh, points that you can see, and those are seen in different photographs taken from different positions, and uh, as we see on the on the lower part of that uh, diagram. So the camera is moving and as it moves the position, the relative positions of those features move as well. And so we can exploit that, that sense of, of the movement of the targets in the images to build a 3D model of the scene. And, um, and that's what we do. And so I'll talk, talk us through that over the next few slides. The lower left picture here uh, just shows uh, a dense cloud of points that are colored uh, from a part of the surface rupture of the 2010 El Mayor Cucupa earthquake that was generated from about 500 photographs that were captured using a helium blimp that was lifting a camera. And a lot of the slides I'm showing were originally designed and built by Ed Nissen, who is at the University of Victoria. Next. So uh, just a quick comparison between LIDAR and Structure from Motion. So we do need the, the laser system for LIDAR. It works well, however, in densely vegetated landscapes because it's an active system. So we can push the laser through the veg to the ground. Whereas if we're looking in the pictures for common points on the ground, it might, might be more difficult in dense vegetation. So we might really only sense the, the vegetation itself. And the LIDAR uses precise time of flight measurements, but could have artifacts in the GPS and the IMU. The structure for motion can use a cheap camera or a, an expensive camera, uh, but and it gives us colored points and we can make a, a, a map of the image of the ground surface called an orthophoto correcting for the relative elevation for texture mapping. And we back solve for camera parameters uh, as part of the calculation of structure for motion, but we do see warping artifacts or doming of the final model, which uh, can be a common problem, but we can also mitigate it. And so this picture on the bottom comes from a, a paper uh, by Johnson et al. In, in Geosphere, where we see kind of a piece of topography and different ways that we can characterize it, either by airborne laser scanning, terrestrial laser scanning, or the structure from motion with either a balloon platform or a UAS or uh, other uh, platforms. Next. So uh, where one place where this was kind of a breakthrough was the, the, the concept of an structure from motion, which came from this artificial intelligence laboratory at Ullman at MIT in 1979. And um, what, he writes in the abstract, the interpretation of structure from motion is examined from a computational point of view. The question addressed is how the three-dimensional structure and motion of objects can be inferred from the 2D transformations of their projected images when no 3D information is conveyed by the individual projection. So I showed the diagram of that earlier, and this is where the algorithm was first uh, presented. Next. So another key part of, of doing structure for motion is finding these matching points. So the other breakthrough was this uh, algorithm called uh, SIFT or um, Scale Invariant Feature Transform. And this comes from a 
presentation in 1999 from David Lowe at the University of British Columbia. And they say an object recognition system has been developed that uses a new class of local image features. The features are invariant to image scaling, translation, rotation, and partially invariant to illumination changes in affine or 3D projection. So let's look at the next slide. And so what that means is that we can have pictures taken from different orientations, different elevations, different um, scales, view angles, and we can use the SIF to find the same feature. So in this case, the red box is showing a, a little tiny channel cut on the side of that bush, and SIFT gives us the power to find those tie points, and that's critical for structure for motion to work. Next slide. So where this was really uh, pioneered and was really captured a lot of imagination was using it for uh, basically mining photography that was publicly available by from tourists who were posting, you know, like their visit to to the Colosseum in Rome. And so these are all different cameras taken from all different positions, but but the structure for motion using SIFT can build a 3D model of that scene from those publicly available pictures. So I uh, always like this really kind of captures the imagination of, of reconstructing the scene structure. So what we mean by that is the geometry of the target, like the Colosseum, but also the positions, orientations, and lens parameters of the cameras themselves. And so that's what's shown in that diagram. All those little triangles are the the camera positions and their orientations. Next. So when we uh, are talking about structure for motion for geoscience, we we often are also citing these first few papers that that we know of where it was employed. So so James and Robson, straightforward reconstruction of 3D surfaces and topography with a camera accuracy and geoscience application was published in JGR in 2012. And Westaby et al. had a paper also in 2012, Structure for Motion Photogrammetry, a low-cost effective tool for geoscience applications in geomorphology. Next. And so just talking through the concept, and this is simplified compared to you know, someone talking about this from computer vision, but uh, just to walk you through it. So traditional stereo photogrammetry you know, what, we're, what we always want is the lowercase b and lowercase h, which is in that landscape below. So the distance between two objects and their relative uh, heights. And, and so then what we have is we have um, camera and pictures that have then the focal length, the lowercase f, and uh, d and d primer, the displacement the, of the positions of those target features in the different images. And then if we know uppercase B and uppercase H, we can sort of reconstruct that that um, landscape, the ground, what we care about. So to do this with traditional stereo photograph photogrammetry requires that we know a lot about the conditions and that the cameras are are, you know, the images are are taken from about the same same elevation and are mostly looking straight down. Next slide. But structure for motion relaxes that requirement for geometric control and just lets us uh, kind of by brute force identify these corresponding features and measure the distances between them on the image plane. And the SIFT or the scale invariant feature transform is the key to letting us find many features that match. Next. So once we have those uh, matching locations and multiple points on the photos, there's just usually one mathematical solution to explain, you know, where the pictures were taken from, what the orientation of the camera was, what its focal length is, and what the, the relative position of the target features on the ground is. And so we can calculate all those, the individual camera positions, um, their orientations, the focal lengths, and the relative positions of those corresponding features on the ground in what's called a bundle adjustment. So we distribute all the error, we find this global solution, and this is the structure for motion step. And so the scene structure refers to all those parameters, and the motion is the movement of the camera. Next. So once we have that, dent, that point cloud and the camera information, we can densify our understanding of the ground uh, 
topography by doing what's called multi-view stereo matching. Matching. So this is a sub step after the structure for motion, strictly speaking, and but it gives us kind of like an order of magnitude or more uh, denser characterization of the ground surface uh, at, in the view. But it requires that we know where those cameras are and their properties to begin with. Next. So key issue, though, is 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 scale. So all of this works in a kind of scale independent sense, like sort of in a pixel scale. And we get the relative 3D positions of everything. But if we want to know the absolute scale uh, and the absolute position of where things are, we need to do geo rectification. And so we have to convert that point cloud from an internal arbitrary coordinate system to a geographic coordinate system. So this is done in a couple of ways next so the first one is if we know a lot about our camera positions and their focal lengths we can do it directly or next indirectly by having some ground control and so this is a key step that's kind of tedious in a typical structure for motion survey is we have to go find some points on the ground those black dots and use some independent survey method usually some differential global positioning system to measure those positions very accurately and then we find them in our structure from motion scene and we basically compute the transformation between our control points and what's in the scene and we apply that to all of the data so uh, directly works okay. Many of our UAS systems, the drones have GPS on board, so they'll stamp the pictures with a position, but we don't always have the orientation information, the pose of the camera. Um, but a lot of times that information straight off the drone GPS is adequate. Uh, but for a really high accuracy uh, structure for motion survey, we would add this georectification geo indirectly after the fact. Next. And so then once we have that that point cloud and and Matt will talk more about what these are in a moment, we can generate derivative products, which would include a digital surface model. So a raster representation of the topography, as well as vegetation, other features that were identified using structure for motion and also an ortho photo with the best uh, image map uh, from that survey. Next. And so I'll hand it back to Matt now. Right. Thanks, Ramon. Structure from motion stuff is really cool. Um, it's really interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about data file formats now. Um, and we're, we, Ramon had mentioned the point cloud, and the point cloud is also the sort of fundamental LIDAR data set. Um, a point cloud is basically a, a series of XYZ points in space. Um, structure from motion can also generate point clouds as part of its workflow. A lot of times, um, those points will have a series of attributes associated with them that the number of attributes will depend on the data collection and what is associated, but those attributes could be return number, point type classification, GPS time, there might be an RGB value. So the attributes will vary. Um, this format was um, developed and is maintained by the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. It's a mouthful. It's the ASPRS. Uh, they established the format and maintain it. Um, I want to put in a plug for the LAZ format. Um, this is a highly compressed form of the LAS. It was developed by Martin Eisenberg, who developed uh, the really popular tool set called Last Tools. Um, and I mention this because um, I've seen compression rates where the LAZ is 10% the size of an LAS. Um, so when you run jobs at open topography, I would really recommend you use LAS because it's going to make your downloads much faster, and it's also going to take up less space on your computer. It is a very common format, so most um, programs can recognize it and read it. So I really high, highly recommend the LAZ format. Um, just a quick mention to some other formats that are out there. Um, uh, COPC and Entwine are two newer formats. They're cloud-optimized sort of formats for point clouds. Basically, they were created to help sort of um, web visualizations and web utilizations of these millions of LiDAR points through the web browser. And so they're very optimized for cloud work. Um, they're still new, so we're seeing how um, they get adopted. 
Um, a lot of the NASA and research-based uh, LiDAR data sets are in HDF5 format. Um, that format's nice because um, it's sort of self-documenting, so you can put attributes and other things with the data all contained, much like the LAS format. Um, there are also plenty of tools out there to work with HDF. Most open topography users don't have to worry about it. I don't think we have any HDF5 formats. Um, and lastly, um, regardless of how the data is supplied to us at Open Topography, we allow users to export in three different formats. You can export it in LAZ, LAS, or ASCII. Um, I would discourage ASCII because the file sizes are really huge, and so your job sizes are limited. Um, so unless you really need it, I would stick with LAZ. Um, this slide's a little dry, but it is something that I, I use every day and is useful to me is um, all uh, last files have a header associated with them. And it has a lot of really useful information about the data that is actually in the last file. And so if you want to just do a quick look at your data to get a feel for is it in the right area, do elevations make sense? You can use tools like last tools or PDAL and some of the tools I'll talk about um, later on to sort of open up the headers and look at them. And you can see things like how many points are there? Is it, does it have points? What are the stats on the min, min max of X, Y, and Z? You could also get a histogram of the classifications. Are there ground classified points? Are there water classified points? Um, so if you're having an issue with a file or you just wanna know more about it, just looking at the headers can give you a lot of information. Um, if you don't wanna do that, open topography, uh, gives you a nice tool um, called the last validation reports. So for every data set um, collection, which has a landing page, we have this last validation report. You can click on it and it has a ton of useful information, um, both at a collection level, but also for each individual uh, LIDAR file that goes into a collection. So you, again, you can get those kind of stats. You can get point density, area, um, a whole lot of information. So if you ever see anything weird with a data set or you just want to know more, um, you can go to our landing page for each data set at the bottom, there'll be a link. And I'll show you this um, later on at the end of the talk. Um, so here's a cool uh, 3D point cloud colored by natural color, RGB values of the Dangemon Preserve in California. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, each one of these point clouds, which is an XYZ point, can have a variety of attributes. And one of those attributes could be RGB values. So um, a lot of LiDAR collections these days also do a concurrent um, orthophoto collection. And so you have orthophotos at the same time as your LiDAR. You can sample the RGB values from those um, orthophotos and apply them to each point in your LiDAR. Structure for Motion, as Ramon talked about, has the benefit of it already, that's its main data product is taking those images. So you already have a colorized um, point cloud when you're taking Structure for Motion data, which is really cool. Um, and this is a cool product because it's very photorealistic, except it's composed of actual just little points. If you zoom in, you'll see um, there might be some gaps, but it's a really cool way of looking at the data. Um, I should also mention you could use this technique to um, apply asynchronously collected um, um, photos. So if you didn't happen to have uh, orthophotos at the same time that your LiDAR was collected, you can find base imagery of the same location and apply those colors. You need to be a little careful if it's an area where there's a lot of change, you could get um, RGB values from a building or something that's no longer there and it's applied to your points, it might look a little weird. Um, our intern last uh, summer did a really cool project and made some Jupyter notebooks where he went in and applied uh, the NAEP National Agricultural Image Program data to some LiDAR data sets and shows how to do that in a Jupyter notebook. We have that on our GitLab if people ever want to see how that's done. So just gonna talk a little bit about point classifications. Most people are familiar with this. Again, this was uh, established by the ASPRS and the USGS 3DAP data uses those um, methods for classification. Um, most people are familiar with the basic ones. Bare earth is what most people with topography are interested in. That's a classification of two, but there's a whole suite of classifications for bridge decks, buildings, low vegetation, mid vegetation, high vegetation. Um, I do want to mention that this is an, sort of an active area where they're actually updating with new classifications. One active area is in bathymetry um, where they're updating the document and they have classifications for 
things you wouldn't even imagine, like a shipwreck at the bottom of, of a shallow sea, there's a classification for that, or something suspended in the water column and the LIDAR hits that, there is a classification if people want to make a classification for that. Um, so it's, it's always being updated and maintained. Um, and so now I'm just gonna go through a very simplistic sort of way of how you would um, get a ground classification for your data sets. Um, so obviously there's a lot of sophisticated algorithms, algorithms out there. Most people don't have to go through this process because it's provided by their data provider. Um, but this would just give you just a rough idea. It was useful to me of how you can calculate uh, a ground surface um, on your own. And what are the, what's the theory behind that? So this is a D spike algorithm and it has three main assumptions. One, that the ground is smooth. Two, that the ground is continuous. And three, that the ground is the lowest surface in the vicinity. So here's our very cartoony uh, Christmas Brown, Christmas, uh, Charlie, Charlie Brown Christmas trees. Um, and this is showing sort of a dispersion of, of LIDAR points where brown is the ground. And basically we wanna try and get just a ground surface from this. And so how would we go about that? Um, the first step would be you'd want to filter your points to just get the last return. So as we mentioned, a, a lot of systems are multi-return systems, so you can get a return from the top of the tree, mid-story, and the, and the bottom. You'd want to take all your last points. Those would, in theory, be the ground, but in some cases they're not, but that's your best bet. So you start with those returns, and then you build a triangulated network from those. So you're creating a surface, and then you're looking for peaks in that surface. So you create this tin and then you look where there's strong convexivities and where these little spikes peeping out. And so then you flag those and then you remove those points and then you rebuild your tin. And so this is a sort of an iterative process. You kind of keep going through this, keep going through this. So you rebuild your tin, find your points that are peaks that are here marked as red and they are standing out from the rest of the surface and you remove those rebuild your tin, um, flag your points, and then remove. And so it's a very time-consuming process because you're iterating, iterating, keep building these tins, but it's a simple but effective way of essentially creating a, a data set that's just ground points. Um, it's computationally intensive, as I mentioned, and it doesn't handle uh, like steep cliffs very well. As you can see, even in our simple, simple uh, little example here, this tree that was on a cliff, since that point got removed, it assumed the ground was this connection. So you could get these little weird artifacts in areas of high slope. Um, but I just want to mention this just as theory and how people can do this is obviously more um, uh, advanced algorithms to do this sort of process. <clears throat> and one of those uh, industries that's sort of driving the new uh, technologies and new algorithms in ladder classification is autonomous vehicles. So as you can imagine, for an autonomous vehicle, LIDAR classification is extremely important. It's a safety issue. So you have a platform that's moving very fast and it doesn't want to run into things like people or dogs or other cars. And so it has this data stream coming in and it needs to classify those points so that it can understand, is it something that I can't hit or is it just a leaf blowing in front of the road? Um, it's interesting to me because this industry has sort of the opposite problem of most scientists. Scientists want as much data as we can. We want to map everything, whereas autonomous vehicles need to just collect the minimum amount of data that they can collect to accurately assess an item. So they're trying to filter data down to its minimal components so that they can say, okay, this is a person, this is a car, this is a wall, um, because that car is moving very fast and they have huge data streams coming in and they can't overload the processing of those computers. So it's a really interesting problem and it's driven, no pun intended, a lot of um, sort of technology and new algorithms in this field. Um, so, at Open Topography, our main goal is to sort of help users use the data. We want to make it easy for you to access LIDAR data. LIDAR data can be sometimes difficult to work with, and we try to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, but there could be times where people want to dig into the data themselves, or maybe we don't uh, provide 
something that they need. And so I just want to mention some of the open source tools that are out there um, that are really useful. Um, so the two big players in this field are Last Tools, which is made by Rapid Lasso. Uh, Martin Eisenberg was the creator of these, and PDAL. And so um, PDAL is really powerful and it's a bit of a learning curve. The only downside is it's only command line. So if users are not really super familiar with command line work, it might not be the best option for you. Um, Last Tools is kind of nice in the sense that it um, can work on the command line, but it also has a GUI for people that are not super comfortable with working in the command line. Um, Cloud Compare is really nice, um, has um, a GUI, um, and there's going to be, we're going to talk in one of our future webinars, we're going to have a little section on Cloud Compare as well to show some of its features. Um, and then if you are comfortable with sort of coding and command line stuff, there's a ton of sort of Python based tools. Um, LastPy is a big um, library that's really useful. PDAL has an, a Python API, so you can use all the PDAL tools from within a Python environment. And Whitebox Tools is also really useful um, and has a lot of LiDAR based uh, tools to read in data, manipulate it, look at headers, things like that. Um, so now I'm just going to um, stop talking at slides and I'm going to um, exit and sort of show you some of the ways of getting uh, LiDAR data through open topography. Um, so I'll just highlight them here. The most common that people are familiar with is through our portal. It's the most recommended. Um, it's feature rich. You can do a lot of things, but not everybody wants to deal with the web map or doing things that way. So there are some other options. Um, you can do bulk downloads. Some people want to just grab all the data and work on it, and I'll show you how to get that. Um, a lesser known one is tile index files. So we create a tile index uh, file for each data set, and you can sort of um, download data from within a GIS using that tile index file. Um, and then I'll just point to Open Altimetry, which is a sister project of ours, and they have access to ISAT 1 and ISAT 2 data if people are interested in accessing, looking at photon counting based data or waveform based data. Um, that's a great source. Um, so, I'm going to get out of here. So this is the open topography main page. And I'll just talk real quickly about um, some uh, how to find the data first, because there's two ways. So most people would use the find data map. And you can just select an area. And it'll sort of break down the, tab, the different tabs of what data fell within your area of interest. The first tab is our high resolution LIDAR. That's uh, LIDAR data sets that we host at open topography. Um, we also have uh, the USGS 3DEP LiDAR, uh, NOAA LiDAR datasets. Community contributed data is data that is uploaded to our servers from our users. And then we have a global and regional DEMs, which are raster based, which I won't talk about in this talk. Um, so that's sort of one method where you can uh, find data. But if you also know uh, the name of your data set and you want to specifically jump to it, you can click on that data catalog. And this is a full listing of all of the data sets within open topography. So you can um, scroll through and find things that way if you happen to know the name of the data set you're interested in. Same tabs. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, go to one of our data sets. This is a New Zealand data set. Um, I'm gonna just quickly highlight that last validation report that I talked about here at the bottom. So this is what we call our landing page. Every data set will have a landing page, has its DOI, some metadata, attribution, some stats. The bottom, uh, you have your metadata report, you have this last validation report, and you can click on um, the different tabs to sort of see some basic stats about that data. Um, it's kind of cool. I, I always liked sort of, um, seeing this one because you can get sort of stats for each uh, each file. You can get the area, the dense point density. So there's a lot of useful information here. Um, but if you were to run a, just a standard open topography job, you go to the point cloud and you'd select a region. 
And then I just wanted to mention just quickly, depending on the data set, we'll have a different number of classifications. At Open Topography, we don't reclassify the data. We take the data as it is and provide it to you. There is a potential of us coming up with a new tool of reclassifying data, but that's still in the works. As of now, we accept the data as it comes in. Um, so you can see for this data set, you have buildings, ground, unclassified vegetation, water surface, excluding noise. So you can sort of filter the data here. And then here's the options for outputting the data in those three different formats. Um, below here are derived products that can you generate from these point clouds. I won't talk about that here. That's next week. When I talk about rasters, we'll go into um, some of the details of these different raster products that you can create. Um, so that is if you were accessing the data through the web portal. Um, I also mentioned there's a bulk download option. So if you go to the main page, there's usually a bulk download button. And if you click on that, it'll pop up this little window. If you're comfortable with the command line, the AWS command line tools, uh, if you have that installed, you can just run this AWS command to either list the data, download single files, download all the files. Um, if you're not coming on the little command line, you can use Cyberduck. Cyberduck's a pretty common sort of FTP application, but it can do other protocols. And so you can um, download the data that way. Or if you just select agree, it'll take you to this min.io browser. In this browser, you can just see all the files that are in a collection. And if you happen to know the name that you wanted, you could just select them all and then uh, select download as zip and it'll zip up those files um, and deliver them to you. So um, it's another way of just getting data. Again, if you happen to do it, want to do it that way, it, it's available to you. Um, and let me go back. Excuse me for a sec. I just need to move this. Um, and so the third way I was going to talk about um, was using the tile indices. So if again, if you're at the landing page for each data set, if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, there's this tile index in shapefile format. If you select download that, it's a zipped up shapefile. And you can bring that shapefile into um, a GIS system. So here I have uh, one of these tile index files and um, I unzipped it and I loaded it into QGIS. And you can see it's just basically a series of squares uh, showing the bounds of each uh, LiDAR tile. Um, but if you use the identify button and select on it, it'll bring up the attribute table in the right hand side. And it has some stats, it has the name, number of points, uh, min, min and max for the X, Y, and Z. But more importantly, it has this the URL directly to that tile. So then you click on that and it'll download that LiDAR file um, to your system. Um, what's nice, if people use uh, one system I noticed was Global Mapper. Um, with Global Mapper, it's kind of cool in that uh, it'll just suck the LiDAR directly into the program. So it bypasses that step of you having to manually load it. It recognizes that it's downloading the file and will load it automatically. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned I was just gonna uh, show, um, I was gonna show the um, ISAT two and one data. So if I go back to the find data map, and you can see in our legend under other data sources, there's the ISAT one and ISAT two. If you click on that, it takes you to the Open Altimetry uh, website and you can browse and access both ISAT1 and ISAT2 data, uh, download them, look at them. It's a really nice interface. If you're interested in that data set, um, it's a really um, nice way to grab the data and visualize it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop. Let me put this back and open up if anyone has any questions. Um, here's our social media and um, our contacts. If, if anyone wants to contact us this way, you can always email us. Um, one of us will sort of definitely reply. You, a lot of the emails come to me, so I will be one of the ones answering the questions. Cool. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Matt, Thank for you. pushing yeah. us Thanks. along. That was great.
Yeah, thanks, Matt and Ramon. Um, so we've been answering some questions as we've gone through them in the Q&A, but there was a couple that were maybe easier to talk about than to answer typed, so I've been sort of holding those back. So the first question was, what's the general accuracy for each method? Obviously, a very expensive LiDAR can be very different from a UA, from UAS photogrammetry, but what's a general comparison? Do you want you guys want to answer that? Uh, <laughs> Ramon, I mean, I generally the airborne... The aircraft that we have, at least the ones that we have in in, in open topography now, are at the decimeter sort of um, vertical accuracy. Um, light, uh, Ramon, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think like a lighter on a drone, it's more on like the meters meter scale kind of accuracy. Yeah, it just really depends. If the drone has good, you know, differential GPS and RTK, you know, you probably could actually do still decimeter uh, or finer positioning for uh, LIDAR, you know, on a other platform. Um, and, and, you know, usually I like to talk about the airborne laser scanning data are sort of the most accurate common data sets that we have because you know we sort of i think you can hang a lot on an airborne laser scanning data set because it's kind of uniformly has that decimeter scale accuracy but it takes a lot of work to to produce that and there are you know there is noise out in there uh, for various reasons uh you know the structure for motion with the bundle adjustment we get some kind of global solution which is pretty good internally although there are some doming and warping across the models usually that then we sort of tamp down with this external georeferencing um but there's also the scale of the survey so you know airborne laser scanning you could fly hundreds of kilometers and uniformly just hanging around at that kind of decimeter accuracy on the other hand you could do an sfm model of of a you know like a, a pot or something you know some sort of artifact and you would be you know internally sort of the accuracy it would be higher but it's because the whole thing is a smaller survey so it's actually kind of challenging to answer maybe let's toss it also yeah. to chris to get his take mm -hmm. on it yeah, I was gonna say, and the other thing about the SFM is really a lot has to do with land cover. So if you're, you know, SFM, if you're flying over bare ground, you can begin to approach LIDAR or exceed LIDAR, airborne LIDAR. But but if you've got vegetation, um, your accuracy, especially if, if you're looking at a bare earth model, is certainly going to be lower than you get with a with an airborne laser scanner. So yeah, it's a it's a really the reason I held this one was because it's a really kind of like complicated, not easy to answer question that's very specific to the instrument you're using, the site you're surveying, and, and many other factors. Yeah, and and I as I hesitated when I was talking about this artifact is because you could do SFM of an artifact, but also you know get your iPhone lidar and and or iPad lidar and do it as well, and and that can be pretty accurate although uh you know it depends a bit on on you know how the phone is dealing with its georectification um but yeah so let then moving on to the next question yeah so that's that's uh what's the preferred resampling method for point cloud data through open topo the nearest neighbor but linear etc is there a significant difference in product quality depending on the quality of data sampling method etc so i think Resampling here just refers to rasterization in this context. So how you go from point data to say a digital elevation model from those points. So I'll let one of these guys answer that question, but I was going to preface and say that we will talk more about this next week in the webinar. We're going to talk. So today was like points and what where points come from and how you get point data tomorrow. Next week will be once you've got the point data, more about sort of the raster data space. So, but yeah, you well, this well, question? yeah, next week we'll talk about that because uh, we have two different methods in Open Topography that enable users to do a tinning algorithm, or you can do gridding um, and, and interpolation that way. Um, it depends. I mean, I have some nearest neighbor is going to preserve your data the best and will introduce the least amount of sort of artifacts. But a lot of times, if you have large gaps in your area nearest neighbor is going to lead to some really weird stuff too and you might need to use a bilinear interpolation in those cases um in terms of the product quality again that's sort of it's really variable based on the in, like the instrument that's used and sort of the conditions um but in general a lot of the, our data is from ncom and um 
uh, and other sort of sort of corporate lidar collectors, and and they really do a good job of sort of, you know, they have a whole team behind clamping down the areas, doing the classifications. In general, the quality is is pretty good. It's you know, like I said, most of the aircraft stuff is decimeter vertical accuracy. Um, it's pretty reliable. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to say about that question. Yeah, I think you said it well. You know, we have this kind of high performance triangular irregular network tool that we use for production, and and so part of it's just that it runs well. Uh, that this tinning or kind of meshing is good, as you said, for covering gaps. If you have sort of this really heterogeneous spacing, which can happen, as you said, for the ground return. So there's big gaps under the veg. So you need to span the gap. Um, the other thing I'll say is, is, is part of this question is also what's the resolution that can be supported. So, you know, you can make a one centimeter digital elevation model, but if you're points are only a few points per square meter then you're really interpolating a lot and and so probably the method will will give you different results you you know some of these splines and other methods will sort of fit a surface through it that can be kind of wavy versus the tin which is more linear but if you have a, a resolution that's on average coarser than the point spacing then most of the methods are similar because they're 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 really well constrained by the data. Yeah. yeah, and I would just since I would just add that uh, in a lot of cases these lighter data sets, you know, you, as your said, you're working typically working with data set that is in the raster resolution is a half a meter or one meter, but the native point cloud data from the laser scanner might be eight, 10, 12 pulses per square meter. So each meter of landscape is actually quite heavily sampled, and so some of these like simple moving window type approaches where you just take all the data within one one cell and choose the mean value is computationally quite efficient and sort of is a quick way to reduce the data volumes if that makes sense um and then Dan, the follow-up question to this was or sort of comment i guess was it sounds like the providers do allow the raw data and pre-product processing to get to get to the points before it gets to ot so yeah that's correct like typically whether it's the National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping, which is an NCOM, which is an NSF supported organization, or it's a commercial vendor that's doing work for say the USGS through the three dot program, they're producing a specific set of deliverables, which are typically the point cloud with various types of classifications associated with it and some pre-generated raster products, the digital elevation models. So they do a lot of that, the data get QAQC'd and then we start delivering them. So then what the open topography sort of value add is to put those uh tools for data filtering and data discovery and sort of area of interest selection and those kinds of things on top of um the the data sets that we receive from whoever collected them yeah and, and then rugain says is it possible to determine the xyz points with the drone and so the answer is is yes you could do it with a drone based laser scanner or if you have the camera on the drone or uh uas you could do structure for motion to get a point cloud and i'll just uh point sake since we're getting close to the end i made a little demo video uh to illustrate some of the sfm that i'm just gonna stick here in the answer to that question um that kind of walks viewers through the main steps of a typical structure for motion uh, processing workflow, which also points out where the sparse and dense cloud come out. So people could watch that if they are interested. Are there any other questions while we're, looks like we're at the top of the hour and some people are starting to drop off, which we totally understand. Um, the other thing I was going to throw in to the, I'll put it, I guess, in response to that question that Ramon just uh, answered with the YouTube link, but um, Ramon and I taught a, a whole introduction to structure for motion short course last year at the Geological Society of America meeting. Um, and the all the materials from that are on a website at Open Topography in the learn section, and um, including we, re we recorded a, a good chunk of it. So there are um, rec YouTube recordings and things like that. So if you're interested specifically in the SFM, more about SFM, I'd refer you to that 
web page because that's the most recent content. Um, so check that out. That's from 2021. Actually, I guess this one was all virtual. This was during the COVID period. So this one was actually 100% online. So it's all recorded, I guess. And just a quick reminder, just uh, tune in next week if you guys want to learn more about the raster. That, that'll that be the webinar for next week. We'll be dealing with rasters, how we go from these point clouds to rasters and what raster products open topography offers as part of their standard workflow. Yeah, so top of the hour. So unless anyone else has any last minute pressing questions, I don't see anything in the q and I think we'll wrap it up. Um, we'll get this one posted get this one posted online um, hopefully by the end of the day once it gets runs through the zoom process and we'll add it to that landing page uh, that has the table and just a reminder some I got a couple emails today the zoom information you use to access yes last week's and this week's will apply for this the whole series of webinars so we'll have we'll have um you won't need you won't get another email with information so thanks everybody see you uh, next week